Good morning, my friend. I'm so happy to see you made it here today because as always, we have gathered here in the name of Jesus Christ. Glory be to God, he is alive, he lives. We've started this morning a little early. It's nine o'clock here in Ray, Colorado. I just got that great feeling that there's nobody's coming physically to the church, but nevertheless, I see the importance in preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. I mean, if you know the only escape from hell, the only escape from eternal suffering is found in Jesus Christ. How much do you have to hate somebody in order to keep Christ from them? <laughs> Might be something to think about. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for all the wonderful things you're doing in our lives. I thank you for the good people you have surrounded me with. I thank you, Father, for all the encouragement you provided me with. I thank you, Father, for all the good things I have come to know within my life because I know they're coming from you. Thank you. I thank you for allowing me to be the good steward of this house of prayer. Thank you, Father. Thank you for bringing me into a community full of darkness and envy and strife. I thank you, Jesus, for your love and your grace. As always, I ask that you just fill my mind with your wisdom, my heart with your spirit, and my mouth with your word. I love you, and I thank you always. Amen. You know, I was there on Facebook, and I met somebody who I went to school with back whatever it was, 30, 35 years ago, or however long it has been. And uh, that's the only person, you know, only a few people, you got 300 some associates or acquaintances or phony friends there on Facebook people you're trying to create relationships with, people you're trying to create friendships with, but are very reluctant to do so. And, and then you always get those one or two people, you know, that come along as this, not a friend, but acquaintance, you know, reminded me, hey, don't you stop, or would you stop? putting your Bible videos on my Facebook page. And, and they say it in such a way you, you can just feel the anger, feel the hatred for the gospel, feel that hatred for Jesus Christ and, and those who submit their lives to Jesus Christ. You can feel it through their words. And who do you think you are, they say to come stuffing your religion down my throat. And throughout all of their posts and, and the stuff that they were sharing online, they are very unhappy, very miserable. They're an alcoholic. They obviously hate the gospel and, and hate their life as well. And that's what comes, that's what comes with the rebellion. When you rebel against Jesus Christ and, and I tell them, you know, I, 
You can block me, but you're never going to stop me. And if you don't want me sharing the video to your Facebook page, then hit the like button. Leave an encouraging comment. Let me know you've received the message. Let me know you're listening to the message. Because I don't think I could live with myself knowing someone is walking down the path to eternal damnation and, and, and I, yet I did nothing to stop it. I did nothing to deter it. I, I just allowed them to walk down that path freely. And I think that's the thing with God, having that heart for God, having the spirit of God in you and with you, it's, you know, not about casting out demons. You know, we, we, a lot of people always want to put the blame on the demons, want to put the blame on the devil for the way you're living, for the choices you've made. Instead of confessing the way I'm living and the choices I'm making aren't working out so good for me. It's left me weeping, gnashing of the teeth. It's put me in a place of frustration, anger, and hatred for the only true God. That's the thing. There's only one true God in this world, in our existence, within our knowledge, and that is Jesus Christ. That's Jesus Christ. There is no other God but Jesus Christ. There is no other salvation than that which was found in Jesus Christ. And there's many that don't re uh, believe that. And everybody has their right to believe whatever they want. And God so allows it that way. But God also, Jesus Christ also, comes into the world to destroy the works of Satan, to destroy the path that people are walking down with an end of, of eternal damnation. He, he comes and that's the stumbling stone. He places himself on that path, trying to prevent you and deter you to the end, redirecting you, reguiding you to a righteous path, one where there is happiness, one where there is joy. That's, that's the thing with coming to Jesus Christ and coming to the gospel and coming knowing God. He's, he seeks your well-being. He seeks your health. He wants to restore your health. He wants to restore your well-being. He wants to help and restore that broken spirit within you or your broken heart. It comes through the acknowledgement of truth. Jesus is the truth. Allowing the Holy Spirit within our heart and our mind in our lives will transform us, it will build us up, it will reignite within us a new sense of life, rising us up from the ashes, rising us up from the miry mare, rising us up from that place of weeping and gnashing of the teeth of frustration and depression alcoholism, drug addictions, whatever it may be. A lot of those things come from a side effect that, you know, the alcoholism, the drug addictions are side effects that come from being abused and, and abused as children, sometimes abused as a spouse, uh, abused as an adult. Sometimes it comes from 
going into a place where you thought you were going to find Jesus Christ, but instead of finding Jesus Christ, the gospel, and the Holy Spirit, you found witchcraft and the practice of witchcraft. And it guided you down a place of utter frustration and destruction. If it's of God, it's not going to seek your destruction. It's not going to harm you. And if you go into a church or a religious place and after being there, it turns you away from Jesus Christ, that, that's the signs we should be recognizing, the signs that confirm you were in a place of demonic worship a place where you had witches and warlocks and necromancers and evil doers masquerading as angels of light. Because you should never come into the presence of Jesus Christ and then be turned away angry and upset and more frustrated unless you're living in a place of denial, right? Like Pharaoh. <laughs> Pharaoh and those of Egypt were, were living on the shores of denial, or the Nile. <laughs> Their hearts became hardened. And what hardened the heart of Pharaoh what was the fact that no matter how hard he tried to call upon the Lord, his God, whoever it was, it was silent and it would not answer his prayers. And his prayers were the destruction of the Hebrew people or the Israelites. God prevented that. And the more he sought to destroy the Hebrews and the Israelites, the more destruction came upon himself and his own people. Wasn't real sure what we're going to talk about today. This morning, during our Bible reading, we listened to the book of Philippians, and we listened to some of the Psalms which are all good reads and, and good information within them. But I'm thinking today, let's go and return to Psalm 84. And Psalm 84 is a good psalm. It's a psalm talks about and talks to a people who are in that place of weeping in that place of gnashing the teeth, in that place of depression. And it's a reminder that when God is with us, when God is walking with us in life, sometimes it's in those places when we're weeping and gnashing of the teeth, we're frustrated. We're, we're in that place of depression, feeling worthless that God is with us and it's reminding us, I'm there with you in that place. And because I'm there with you in that place, in, in, in that place in life, where it seems like nothing is working out, nothing is going our way. We all struggle with these things. I struggle with these things. Nobody's immune to these things. And, and if you grew up being abused as a child, and that's something that, that I was put back on the path of remembrance, talking to a true friend from social media, somebody I've known and chatted with over the past few years. And reminding her, reminding me in, in a way whether it was intentional or unintentional was irrelevant. It was still was a reminder that over the past 12 years, my calling has been not only to broadcast to the world 
Jesus Christ is coming. He's coming soon. He has heard our prayers. He's heard your prayers. And yes, he loves you. And he loves you deeply. And some people may say, well, where was Jesus when I was being abused? Where was Jesus when uh, my stepfather was sexually molesting me as a child? Where was Jesus when, when I reached out for help and I told my mom and that, that these things were going on and yet my mom refused to acknowledge it as being the truth? I mean, it's horrible to be abused as a child. It's horrible to be abused as a child by those who were put in place to take care of your well-being. Fathers and uncles, right? When, when children are sexually abused, very rarely, very rarely, are they ever sexually abused by a stranger. It's always mom's brother, dad's brother, a father, a stepfather, a mother, or an aunt. Yes, women do engage in the sexual abuse of children. It's not just men, but women as well. And that's horrible. But you know what's more horrible than that? When that child reaches out for help and there's no help for them. When that child says, you know what, mom? I want you to know the truth, and this is the truth, that that person who says they love you is violating me, is breaking me down, is touching me in such a way I've lost all confidence in life. I've lost all confidence in myself. I've lost worth and, and value in myself. And, and that person is molesting me. And, and your mother and the people around you, your aunts, your uncles, your grandmother, refuse to believe or acknowledge that's the truth. There's nothing worse than that. And you go through life. Some of the side effects of, of being abused is going through life without the ability to trust anyone. And, and it's not just being not being able to trust anyone. I can't even trust myself. A lot of children believe that it was their fault. Which, if you were abused, it's not your fault. You're innocent. I want you to know that it wasn't your fault. Where was Jesus? Well, I can tell you now Jesus was with you. And, and, and there's the thing. It wasn't that Jesus was with you watching it go on, watching it happen. It wasn't that Jesus was there standing you with you while you were being rejected, discredited. No, it was like this. Jesus was standing in front of you and, and, and that perpetrator, that monster, had to go through him in order to get to you. They, they came to me first. They violated me first. They rejected me first. They wouldn't listen to me first. Because Jesus was standing in our way, by the time they got to you, they were all worn out. Thank God for that. Could you imagine what they had done if they were there in full vigor and full strength? wasn't that they weren't listening to you. They, they weren't listening to Jesus Christ as Jesus Christ was screaming out to be heard that, hey, there's evil going on. And, and they knew there was probably something going on. They knew within their heart and within their mind because Jesus kept whispering in their ear. And yet they were so disgusted with 
that act, they were so afraid of that evil, they sat there in a place of denial, saying it's easier to not confront it, it's easier to just ignore it. I mean, there's nothing worse in life, right? Than, than having to admit that the person whom you put your trust in, that person in whom you said, I love, is the same person breaking down and molesting your daughter. There's nothing worse in life than to have to say, you know, that person I grew up with, my brother, is the person molesting my daughter. Nothing worse in life than having to confess and say that that person I raised, my son, is molesting my granddaughter. Bad thing worse, right? And those who are being molested and rejected and not heard and not listened to, or you robbed me of my value, you robbed me of my voice, you robbed me of everything that was mean meaningful to me. Robbed me of everything. My ability to trust, my ability to love myself, my ability to love my mother and my family. Robbed me of everything. My ability to put my faith in Jesus Christ. That person would say, you, 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 you don't know real sin until you were the one who violated. Can't even imagine the horrible things went through. And it leads people down those paths of alcoholism, drug addictions, not being able to trust in anyone. When you can't trust in no one, you can't trust in yourself. When you're blaming yourself for putting yourself in a position to be molested. I know it was all my fault because uh, I could have stayed at school. I didn't have to come home at, from school. And boy, I, I, I rushed right home early this day or that day, whatever day it may have been, only to find that predator waiting for my return. And then when you can't escape from that predator and it just goes on over and over and over, you blame yourself, which is normal. It's not abnormal to do that. It's not abnormal to feel guilty. It's not abnormal to lose trust in everyone. That's normal. That are normal responses. It's a normal action. It is very normal. It's a normal response and a normal action to become a drug addict or an alcoholic. Finding relief from the things that hurt you and the pain and the suffering. It's normal. You're not abnormal. I get it. I understand. That's why I want to go to Psalm 84. Psalm 84. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts! My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. Being in the courts of man, being under the, the scrutiny of man's judgment. It's never a good place because man doesn't want to live in truth. They much rather believe in a lie 
than to believe in the truth because it's easier. But God is righteous. That's one thing we can put our trust in is that God is righteous. How do I know I'm standing in the presence of God? Because God is righteous. God cares about you. God cares about your mental health, your broken heart, your life, and your well-being. God cares for you. He doesn't seek your destruction. He doesn't seek your harm. He cares for you. He loves you. And so we seek to enter into the courts of God. You know why we want to seek into or to enter into the courts of God? Because God loves the truth. He loves the truth. And he wants to stand up for your brokenness. He wants you to experience justice. Even the sparrow finds a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young at your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Jesus Christ is our King, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the God of gods. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending, the least and the greatest. There is no other God than Jesus Christ. He is our Lord. Even the sparrow seeks refuge at the altars of God, because God cares. He cares for the sparrows. He raises the animals. He knows them by name. And we have many animals, and we have many birds and things all across the world. And how did they become when they don't even have the wisdom and the knowledge of what love is? Everything they do, they do by the power of instinct. And yet we have wisdom. We know what love is. And we're not doing it by the power of instinct. We do it by the power of wisdom and knowledge. Every mother has to raise their child to love. You have to teach your child how to love. And you teach them how to love by loving them. You, you teach your child how to be joyful by sharing laughs with them. <laughs> It's very important as a parent, and especially if you're a new parent, you gotta laugh. You gotta fill your home with laughter and joy. Because in that, you're teaching your child how to find joy and how to laugh. If your home is always full of negative energy and anger and hatred and, and violence and arguing, so what you're teaching your children, this is what you can hope for when you move forward in life, when you're married. You want to teach your child? You want to teach a little girl it's okay for a man to slap you around? Be a dad who slaps around his child. You want to teach your daughter it's okay for you to be treated as though you were nothing more than a prostitute or a piece of meat? Molest that child. You want to destroy a human being? Engage in sexual immoralities against that child and you will destroy a human being. You could go through all the stories there of all those people lost and swamped in homelessness. And one by one, you could go through and find out that 99% of them were sexually abused as children. 80% of all Christians, male or female, 80% of all Christians were sexually abused. And they weren't sexually abused by other Christians 
because they were sexually abused, because they were broken, because they were damaged, they found Jesus Christ, and in Jesus Christ they found a deliverer. They found strength. They found confidence. They found the ability to trust in someone, to trust in something. Blessed are those who dwell in your house ever singing praise. Is your house full of singing, of praise, praise to the Lord? I'm sick and tired of listening to YouTube, Facebook, and, and online, all these fake antichrist-filled people. People who are filled with the antichrist spirit, trying to bring to you little tidbits of the gospel, dressed in tattoos and, and makeup <coughs> and jewelry, <coughs> dressed in rebellion telling everybody that the church is evil, attacking the church. And the church is the gathering of believers, and they've gathered together by the power of the Holy Spirit. God is all in all, and if you can't see God in all of it, in the believers, in the gathering of the believers, then you probably can't see God at all. And that's the truth. If you can't see Jesus Christ shining forth from me, you're either blind or in denial, or God forbid, I'm not living my life rightly. I, I ask myself, I've been out there on the cattle ranch, and I work all the time, and I ask myself, you know, what am I to be? I wanna be like Christ, I wanna be like you, Jesus. I wanna be like you, Father. What does that mean? Does it mean I, I come into the world and I create a gathering of, of phony believers and, and, and cast out demons? Do I come into a religious organization and begin speaking in, in a language that no one can understand, just a, a sense of babbling and nonsense? Do I, I go out and reach out to all the cripples and the paralytics and those sitting in wheelchairs and, and stand up and walk. I want to be like you, Christ. What does that mean? And as Paul reminds us there in the book of Philippians, servant, be a, a servant. Mm. Be a slave, be a servant, be surrendering to a will that is not of your own. And sometimes in that, I don't need revenge. I don't need to see the destruction of my enemies. I just surrender to the will of God. Somehow, some way within that horrible childhood. I found God. I found Jesus. I found love. I found healing. I found a way out of the drug abuse. I found a way out of the alcohol. You know, that's the thing. You know, drug addictions and alcohol addictions and those things are not of God because they harm us, they destroy us, they break us down. And I'm reminded that the people I work for out there on the cattle ranch, one guy is 88 years old, old man, and his wife is 86 years old, and you're just serving their will. Whatever it is they will, whatever it is they desire, you, you go and you check in every morning and what would you have me do today, my Lord? And long, sometimes it's, it's, I want you to do things that, that weren't 
of my choosing. Oh, this is crazy. This is dumb. Why am I doing this stuff? Doing things that have nothing to do with being a cowboy. Doing things I didn't expect to do, had nothing on my mind to do, but it's what they wanted, so you do it. I am your servant. Are we our children's servants? We come into our father's house and, then, and our father presents himself to us as a servant. Jesus Christ being in the form of God, able to do the things of God, like walk on water and feed 5,000 people with a few loaves of bread, a couple of fish, give sight to the blind and, and, and hearing to the deaf to rise up that crippled man <clears throat> from his bed of paralytic, paralyzed stuff. Rising them up to walk in strength, trading their strength for his strength. And yet, he didn't come to be worshipped. I think sometimes a lot of people want to be worshipped. I want something to lord over you. I want to have a power far greater than your power. If anybody out here is going to deliver a demon out of your heart, it's me. Now gather over here and let's go. But first, I have to condemn you. I have to place the demon upon you and then release you from it. And, and that's being in a church filled with witchcraft. A church not on the path of God. No, we are servants. God came in the form of a man. Jesus Christ came in the form of a human being to serve us, to serve us, those who are unable to serve themselves. Like the lame, the blind, the poor. He was such a servant to the will of God not my will, but the will of God. And the will of God was to manifest his word in our lives. Jesus being the word, manifesting that word into a reality, into an action. Show them that I love them just as I have loved you since the beginning of creation. Saying that to his word. He lays down his life. He's so obedient to the word of God, to the will of God. He lays down his life. He's willing to die, having the power to not die. And yet, even subjects himself to rejection. They wouldn't hear me. They wouldn't listen to me as he was standing there trying to be your voice. Can you imagine a little kid being sexually abused who has no voice? I have no voice. And even if I could scream out for all the universe to hear me, no one would believe in speaking the truth. Jesus comes to be our voice. Blessed are those whose strength is in you and whose heart are the highways to Zion. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with pools. 
the valley of Bacchus. Oh, there's this valley the Israelites when they were on their 40 year <clears throat> journey of wandering aimlessly through the wilderness, being guided by God through the pillar of smoke by day and a pillar of fire there by night. They, God was with them in their presence all the while. And they, at one time they go through the Valley of Baca and in the Valley of Baca, it was like a, a great valley and, and, and the mountains were weeping. There was so much water coming down that as they're walking through the valley, the mountains were weeping. And they were in a place of weeping and depression, and feeling worthless and unvalidated. Feeling as though they did not matter. It's a place of great weeping and sorrow, rejection. But in it, they make it a place of springs. And what sprang forth from that place of weeping and that place of rejection and that place of being violated and abused? What sprang forth? A cry. A cry. If my mama ain't gonna listen to me, or my daddy ain't gonna listen to me, if my grandma ain't gonna listen to me, then surely the Lord will listen to me. And Jesus saying, I, I not only have been listening to you, I have heard your cries. I've heard your prayers. And I will rise you up from the miry mud. I will rise you up from the ashes. I will rise you up from that place where you were in despair and crying, and the blessing was, I was there with you during it all. Whatever it was you think they did to you, they did it to me first. They hated me for no reason. They wouldn't listen to me for any reason. I came to bless them by turning them away from their sins. And then they trampled all over me like I was a worthless piece of dung. I screamed out and said, stop in the name of the Lord. That one belongs to me. And they just thrusted me to the side. The early rain also covers it with poles. He, he didn't just have the weeping of the mountains and the springs of water. You had a blessing of pools of water, the living water found in Jesus Christ. Even as he says to the woman at the well, if you knew me, you would have asked me for water and I would have gave you water and you would have never thirsted again. Where is this water? <clears throat> Where can I find this water? Because this well is deep and I have to come here day after day, year after year, month after month, week after week. I'm always returning to get more water. And then once I draw the water up from this deep well, I got to carry the water all the way back to my house. Where is this everlasting water that will quench my thirst? What does Jesus say? Go get your husband and bring him here to me. The everlasting, that living water is, let me tell you what happened when I heard the voice of Christ. Let me tell you, let me sing praise. She says, let me tell you the truth. I have no husband. Oh, you are honest in that. I know you have no husband. And the five you were married with were never your husband. And the man you're living with now, he's not your husband. 
I am your husband. The Lord your God is your husband. Your husband is the man of the household, the protector, the provider of all things good. I provide for you shelter. I provide for you food. I provide for your clothing. I provide for you protection. I provide for you the truth. She goes out and she begins to tell everybody about Jesus Christ. Here is that flowing water that will never run out. Here, here is the rain and the pools of water while walking through that valley of Baca, of weeping. Jesus Christ with me. <laughs> my, my, all of my husband's abused me and treated me like trash. I have no value and I'm worthless. But Christ came to me in the midst of my weeping. And the gnashing of my teeth when I was frustrated, when I was feeling worthless, Christ came to me. And I found a blessing in Christ. And the blessing that I found was God's word said, I love you. And then it was manifested through the body of Jesus Christ who came with arms wide open. Here I am to prove my love is true. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in sign. Everyone is going to be judged by God. We have life, and then after life comes the judgment, and the judgment is standing in, in the appearance of God. The, the truth will come out. The truth will be known. And, and I will go from strength to strength. I, I was in that place of, of feeling worthless and unvalidated and, and, and devalued. I was broken and violated and hurt and I was robbed and I was stolen of everything that was good to me. My dignity. And when I cried out for help, no one would listen to me. And, and everybody rejected and denied me. And they took the side of those who were workers of evil. You believed in the predator. Believed in the perpetrator. You believed in the violator. which broke my strength, devalued me, broke down my ability to trust, and then I'm gonna go from strength to strength. And now I know my voice is being heard. <clears throat> the truth is being heard. God is my adventure. God is my strength. I found strength in hating you. Right? If you were ever molested as a child, you're gonna say, I found strength in hating you. The perpetrator, the violator, the monster. But then I found a new strength. A strength that set me free from anger and frustration 
and hatred. A strength that I found in Jesus Christ. I forgive you. How dare you come to me telling me that I'm going to find power and strength and forgiveness when this person violated me and broke me down to such a robbed me of everything good. And then you say, I'm going to find strength and power and forgiveness. Yeah, because in forgiveness, you're going to be released from the anger. You're going to be released from the hatred. And because you've been released from the anger and the hatred, you don't have to revisit that day ever again. See, when you're angry and you're full of hate, you're always revisiting that thing that happened in the past. You're living in death. And the past is no more. Instead of living in death, live in life. Because in life, I live for Christ. Christ is life. And I live, and I live for Christ in life. And so I forgive, and because I've forgiven, I have the ability to forget, and then I don't have to return to that day that keeps me angry, that keeps me full of hate. Instead, I'm going to move on. I'm going to rob you, Mr. Violator, of your power that has imprisoned me into a place I hate being. Because so long as you live in anger and you, so long as you live in hatred, they have power over you. And so you let go of their power by forgiving. I don't have to see your demise or your destruction. I'm going to move from strength to strength. And I'm going to move into the strength that I find at the right hand of God that's full of power, and glory, love, and grace. I forgive you. And, it, and it's just the same as Jesus saying to us, to the child, to that whom was violated and molested and abused. I forgive you for not trusting in me. I, I, I forgive you for feeling guilty when you never should have felt guilty. Sometimes we have to say to ourselves, I, I forgive myself for believing the lie. And the lie was that I thought I was guilty of something. And you are never guilty of anything innocent. And I have to forgive myself for believing that it was my fault. It wasn't your fault. This person is a violator and a perpetrator and a manipulator, and they knew what they were doing. They knew how to take advantage of you. Forgive yourself. Forgive yourself for believing that you had to live your life under this cloud of shame as though everybody knew what happened to you. <laughs> you can forgive yourself, Jesus saying, I forgive you for not believing. I loved you, even in your unbelief. I forgive you. And you can say, you know what, I'm going to find strength in forgiving myself, and I'm going to find power in forgiving the perpetrator. O oh Lord of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O oh God of Jacob. Who is Jacob? Jacob is the heel grabber. The heel grabber. That person that's grabbing on the heel of the successful. 
There's nothing successful in me. There's no good in me. So I'm going to grab hold of the heel of he who was promised. He who is successful. I'm going to grab hold of the heels of Jesus Christ as he rises from the grave. Hear me, oh God, hear my prayer. Behold our shield, oh God. Look on the face of your anointed. And who is the anointed? Jesus Christ. Look at the face of Jesus Christ. And through the sorrowful compassion of Jesus Christ, there's Jesus Christ hanging on the cross, grieving over the sins of the world. Look upon the face of Jesus Christ that we may be blessed. Recognizing and understanding everything that violator did to me, he did it to Christ first. Look upon the face of Christ and see my suffering and see my sorrow and see my pain and see my worthlessness. See my salvation. See my deliverer. My shield is Jesus Christ. My rescuer is Jesus Christ. My hope is Jesus Christ. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of the wickedness. And I think that's why I'm so thankful to be here. So thankful to be able to preach to you the gospel of good news that in Jesus Christ there is deliverance. There is salvation. There is something good. It's the love of God. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God even if that house was empty, than to be in the courts of the wicked, to be judged as a wicked, to live my life as a man full of wickedness. Your redemption draws near. For the Lord, God, is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the one who trusts in you. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the one who trusts in you. Quick word from Philippians letter from Paul to the Philippians. Chapter 3. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs and look out for evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Jesus Christ and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone thinks he has reason or confidence in the flesh, I'm more. 
circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. As to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever I gain, whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the sur surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For this sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and, and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law but that which comes to faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. And all of his righteousness and blamelessness as according, following the laws that were written as according to Moses, Moses brought law. But Jesus Christ brought grace and truth. He brought grace and he brought the truth. Everything was lost. My value, my self-esteem, my identity, my dignity, all of it I counted as loss. I lost it all so that I may gain righteousness in Christ. I'm not here to display a righteousness of my own, but the righteousness in Christ that comes through faith. And this is what I believe, that Christ loves me. This is what I believe, that Christ loves you. There's no power, there's no rule, there's no principle, there's no statute, there's no work of the devil, there's nothing in creation, in this reality, in our world, above the world, in the spiritual realm, below the earth or in the depths of the sea that can take us away from the love of Jesus Christ, the love of God found in Jesus, my word manifested in your life. I counted my, my life suffering and I suffered all these things so I could be like Christ. And because I suffered these things to be like Christ, I have confidence that just as Christ rose from the dead, so shall I. So shall you. That's our confidence. Because God loved us. Because God loved you. He sent you, Jesus Christ. And he gave you the strength to believe in Christ. So that you would not perish. But have eternal life. Because God so loved you. So I have my faith in Christ. My faith is in God's love. 
that even while I was being broken down and even while I was being molested and even while I was being abused and even <clears throat> while I was being rejected and denied the truth, the love of God was not removed from me. And so I found my value and my worth in Christ. Not my righteousness, but in the righteousness of Christ. In Christ, I have no sin, and my sins are no more. Gracious Father, I love you. I love you, Jesus. Blessed is he who trusts in you. And even when I can't see it, and it's hard to believe in it, I'm going to trust in you with everything I have. I trust you with my voice. I trust you with my life. I trust you with my heart. I trust you with everything that matters to me, all things good. I know all things good are coming from you, and I thank you. I thank you for allowing me to stand in this house of prayer with you this morning. I thank you, Father, for those who are watching and listening today that I just hope you would open their heart and their mind to be able to receive today's message, that your love is steadfast and available for us today. Your love seeks to restore us and to rebuild us and to bring us into your heart, into your home. I just ask that you continue to protect over those who need your protection, to continue to be the voice for those who have no voice. Father, continue to feed us with that manna that came from heaven. Give us today our daily bread that's, that's found in your presence, Father. Give us drink. We seek your water, that everlasting water that quenches the thirst of our need for revenge. Fill us with your love. Fill us with your spirit. I want to be like you, Dad. Guide me and protect me. I love you and I thank you. Amen. Amen. We are here every Sunday morning, 250 East. 4th Street, located right here in Bray, Colorado, if you're interested in worshiping with us, fellowshipping, creating a friendship, I'm available. I'm willing to pray for you. I'm willing to be your friend. I'm willing to talk to you. I'm willing to hang out with you. We're open every Sunday at 9.30 for services. The doors are open at 7 o'clock for a Bible reading. We listen to the Bible for one hour, 7 to 8, from 8 to 9.30 or so, 9 o'clock. We just have coffee and talk and fellowship and try to make friends, share a laugh, a joke, not crude, nasty jokes, but Praise God and loving one another. You're welcome here. Thank you. And God bless you. Until next time, may the Lord be with you all.